Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. At Moose Lake, near Little Fork, Kuchening County, 20 miles south of the Canadian border in Minnesota, I'm writing this with what my father had told me after he came home from hunting. He was hunting near a very small lake in a very remote area. He was about 35 feet in front of Bigfoot, and whatever it was crossed his path without even seeing my father. My father came home that evening in amazement and was very agitated. He just kept shaking his head, saying, no, no, no. It's not something that he tells a lot of people, because he thinks people will not believe him. But his brother was with him and claims to have seen the same thing. And I have other friends that live in that same area. They hunt and jet ski in this area. It's called Moose Lake. Many people are kind of leery of this area because of these sightings. This lake still attracts local people for swimming and jet skiing. Some people still go near this lake as if they are not scared, even with all the local rumors. The people that I know saw it while swimming in this lake, and my father had seen it while he was hunting for partridges. It took place in a very remote area on the outside of a very small town in the very tip of northwestern Minnesota, near a very small, dirty lake. The lake is far away from many people and is at the end of a long dirt road. The lake is in the middle of a thick pine forest and hunters only enter the area. On to the next one. On the Burnt Out Bridge Road, about two miles north of Power Dam Road, hunting location was about one mile west of Burnt Out Bridge Road. This was near Bemdiji in Belt Rami County in Minnesota. I was deer hunting, not far from my home overlooking a cedar swamp. I noticed a black head appearing above the pine trees. The cedars were short growing, a wet lowland, I guess there were six to seven feet at the time. The head would appear and disappear periodically. My best guess was it was eating something and moving around in the lowland. It was visible for 10 to 15 minutes. I would estimate I was 50 to 75 yards away from the creature. No noise and nothing else was noticeable. It did not behave like a bear and I've never seen a black bear upright for that much time. I was sitting down on a downed tree, and my cousin was hunting with me was probably a quarter of a mile away. He didn't see or hear anything. It was early dusk, second week of deer hunting in northern Minnesota. It was a cedar swamp, hardwood ridge overlooking where I was sitting. The local First Nations have reported sighting. Webster Lake is also considered a Bigfoot area. On to the next one. Near Squaw Lake in Chippewa National Forest, I'm sure of what I saw this time and may have seen at another outing. The area is flat logged off forest with patches of timber remaining. The creature I saw had a large frame, broad shoulders, and weighed about 300 plus pounds and was approximately 6 to 7 feet tall. It moved quickly into the timber and disappeared. The creature looked like a very large man in an overcoat. I was a long way down the logging road, and we were logging 11 miles off the main road. There were no other people out there. This is off Minnesota, number 46 road, about 3 p.m. The closest water would be the Mississippi River. On to the next one. In Lake County in Minnesota, it is a heavily forested area dotted with lakes for fishing and good deer and grouse hunting. 
lots of wildlife. While hunting, ruffled grouse with a friend near Bean and Bear Lakes outside the small town of Silver Bay, we heard then saw a large, unidentified creature. We were near an area where there were a lot of berries and were making sure that we didn't stumble upon a bear, which we had done many times. And let me tell you, this was no bear. We heard a howling that made the hair on the back of my neck stand up, literally. We both hit the deck and reloaded our 12-gauge shotguns with slugs. Not a word was exchanged. We were both rather scared. It was nearing nightfall, and we had a long way to go to get back to the car. This is a very rugged and remote area. The howling was intermittent, but we could hear the animal moving. It was a couple hundred yards away. Unfortunately for us, it was directly in our path. This is a swampy lake-filled area with heavy growth. I have traveled all over the world, and this is some of the toughest undergrowth that I have ever seen. We cautiously moved toward the trail and the animal and moved as quietly as we could. We were both experienced woodsmen, and we know this was no timber wolf, moose, bear, or cat. We dropped the three grouse we had shot as a precaution and continued along the trail. Off to our right, we heard movement. I remember being terrified. It was clear that it was a large creature, but it moved very fast. Faster than any bull moose I had ever encountered. It followed us on our right flank for a few hundred yards. It was now approaching dark. We had lights with us, as well as first aid kits. I turned to my friend and pointed. At that moment, we could see a complete outline of this creature. The reason it was visible was that we were in the growth and it was following us, but there was a clearing behind it, an old logging camp area, and the light was still bright behind it. We both hit the deck again. I find it funny that the thought of shooting at it didn't even cross our minds. We were scared. I had worked as a wilderness guide, and this was nothing that I had ever seen before. It walked on two feet and stood at least seven feet tall. There was no way to really tell the color due to the lighting and our perspective, but it was a dark color. We continued on our way, all the while listening to this thing in the brush following us. It was amazingly stealthy. Like I said, we were very experienced woodsmen for our age. We didn't do drugs or drink like other kids our age. We went hunting and fishing. It finally stopped following us as we crossed a ridge toward a more traveled trail. We both remember the day like it was yesterday. We recently spoke of it. We have both since relocated to the West Coast, me to San Francisco and he to Seattle. I also noticed just that howl. I will never forget it. It was dusk, clear day, Light was patchy because of ridge-dropping shadows. It was pine and hardwood birch forest with swamps and lakes. No real structure anywhere around there. I was not much into this sort of thing until I saw it. I'm still not a Bigfoot kook or anything like that. I'm a college-educated outdoorsman, not prone to falling for fairy tales. But the area in northern Minnesota where this happened is very remote. There could be hundreds of them, and we humans would never know. On to the next one. I'm Alice, and this event happened one summer, some 30 years ago, when my little brother Chuck and I were camping with our mom and dad at Two Medicine in Glacier National Park. If you know the park, you'll know that the Two Medicine area is one of the quieter parts of Glacier, as it's on the east side of the park and harder to access from Kalispell. We had a big cabin tent, the kind that would hold a half dozen cots, and I remember it was a pain to set up, as it was heavy canvas. It didn't have a floor, which means all kinds of bugs and things could get in, but it was really watertight and kept us nice and dry as it rained a lot while we were there. 
We stayed at Two Medicine for two weeks, even though we'd planned on going to the other side of the park for one of those weeks. Dad had a two-week vacation, then we had to go back home to Rapid City. Why did we spend an extra week at Two Medicine? I mean, we didn't even get to see the other side of the park, which we'd planned on doing as we wanted to go camp over by Lake McDonald. All I can say was our plans were totally discombobulated by an event none of us could have predicted in a million years. We had our dog, Jake, with us. He was quite the dog, medium-sized and kind of rangy, white with faint red spots, and the vet thought he was a red healer mix. We got him from the shelter, though they called it a dog pound back then. He was very protective, yet liked everybody, and was very gregarious. He also stayed close at hand, which is how working dogs are. Back then, the park wasn't as strict as they are about dogs now, making you tie them all the time. Jake was a free-ranging dog, but he was good about sticking around. He'd always be on the lookout for squirrels and critters, kind of the self-imposed camp guard. He would patrol our camp, looking for trouble. The park also wasn't as busy, and you'd never had a problem finding a campsite. There usually weren't all that many people around, which was nice. Well, we'd been at Two Medicine for a couple of days, hiking and doing all the camping things that go with the summer vacation, having a great time. At night, we'd build a big fire and sit around talking, which was fun as my mom knew a lot of good campfire stories, many revolving around bears or ghosts or things like that. I remember it was the first time I'd ever had a s'more, which is a graham cracker sandwich made with marshmallows and melted chocolate. I think I was around 10 and Chuck was 8. We had a big Coleman lantern that ran on white gas, and Dad would light that inside the tent after the fire went out, so we could all see to get ready for bed. From outside, that big old cabin tent looked really eerie with a lantern glowing inside and shadowy figures moving around. I think Dad got both the lantern and the tent from some army surplus place. We sure didn't have the nice high-tech equipment campers have now, the sleek waterproof nylon tents with built-in pockets to store your clothes and with floors and sometimes even more than one room. But I will say our big old tent was dirty and held up to high winds. It was kind of like sleeping outside as you could hear everything going on around you. Well, we'd been in Glacier almost a week when Jake came running into the tent where we were all sitting around a card table having sandwiches for lunch as it was raining. He immediately ran and hid under one of the cots, shaking. My mom jumped up and said, I think there's a bear outside. Dad also jumped up, and they both went outside, looking around, then came in and told us to get in the car. They'd heard something in the nearby bushes, and given how Jake was acting, they were taking no chances. We actually had to put a leash on Jake and half-drag him to make him come out and go get into the car with us. My mom had grabbed all the sandwiches so the bear wouldn't get them, and we all sat in the car eating, expecting to see a bear at any time. Jake was hiding down on the floor. We tried to get him up on the seat, petting him and talking to him, but he wouldn't budge. We all remarked at how scared he was, as we'd never seen him act like that before. It was odd, because... He was usually the first to go out and check if anything was amiss. We'd even seen him chase off a big bull one time when it had come into a meadow where we were camping in Idaho. But then we weren't sure if he'd seen a bear. Finally, after no sign of a bear, we all got out and Jake decided everything was okay as he followed us back into the tent, quiet but acting more normal. Since it was raining, we spent the rest of the day just hanging around camp, 
reading, and playing card games, my little brother Chuck had decided he was going to turn into a mountain man, so he'd taken up whittling, trying to make a spear out of a stick he'd found. I guess the idea was to spear a fish if we all got hungry. Enough, which was unlikely, given how much food we'd brought. Well, along about evening, Chuck decided he needed a better stick to whittle. He had a new plan. He would make a bow and some arrows. And that way, he wouldn't have to get as close to his prey. He could hunt from afar. I guess he decided he would go after something bigger than a fish. Maybe a rabbit or a squirrel. Not that mom would actually let him hunt anything, especially in a national park. So he and Jake went off into the nearby trees to find some appropriate sticks, though he was told to stay close. Growing up in the Black Hills of South Dakota, which has some really thick forest, we were all pretty savvy about how not to get lost in the woods, and he knew not to go far. Well, it had only been a few minutes, and here came Jake, running like the wind, heading straight for the tent, where he again hid. Chuck was close behind, and I could see he was about ready to cry as he too ran into the tent. Well, we were soon all in the car again, including Jake, who Dad carried this time. Apparently, Chuck had seen the bear, though he described it as a big, hairy man. I've never seen him so scared, and he actually started crying, wanting to pack everything up and go home. My parents patiently managed to get Chuck to tell a story, even though they knew it had to have been a bear. But what Chuck told us was pretty scary, and I remember also wanting to pack up and leave, just like Chuck had said we should. He said he'd been only about 50 feet back in the trees, looking for sticks, when Jake had suddenly turned and ran away, which was so unlike him that Chuck stood there for a moment, before it registered that something dangerous must be nearby. He said he suddenly felt more scared than he'd ever been in his short life, and as he turned to follow Jake, he saw a huge, hairy man standing nearby, holding something that looked like a young gorilla. The thing made a purring-type noise, holding out the little gorilla like it wanted Chuck to take it. As Mom and Dad talked to him, trying to figure it all out, Chuck decided the small gorilla was maybe the child of the large, hairy man which he then decided was a woman, for when it held the young one out away from it, he could see it had breath. He said the creature started making a soft noise as if it were crying, and he was overcome with a sadness that made him want to stop and help it, but he was too scared. Now, let me add a little here about Chuck. He was famous for having an overactive imagination, just about every time he was out after dark, he'd come back inside with stories about UFOs and how they tried to get him to go up with them, or even how he had actually gone up with them. He would describe how things looked from high above, and he usually sounded very convincing. At one point, he had an imaginary friend he named Duda, which was pretty amusing, as he and Duda were always having grand adventures. After reading a book on the Ice Age, he got good at seeing Pleistocene animals around. Things like dire bears and dire wolves. He said he actually befriended a mammoth at one point, and then after that it all segued into dinosaurs. Then one day, after we'd eaten at an Italian restaurant, he had a friend named Pasta for a few months. Well, you get the idea. You'd think with an imagination like that, he would have grown up to be a filmmaker or writer or something but instead he became a mechanic. But I will say that his outlandish story really took a hit after this happened. I think he finally realized what it would be like if his stories were real, and it scared him. Well, after a while, I could tell Mom and Dad really didn't believe him, though they were being very kind and tried to make him understand that such things didn't exist. But somehow this time, it felt different for Chuck didn't usually get emotional when telling his wild tales. Plus, it was kind of hard to explain why Jake was acting so strange. Well, 
We left Jake in the car, and Mom and Dad persuaded Chuck to go show them where he had seen the creature, even though he didn't want to. I didn't want to go, though I didn't really believe the story, so I told them I would stay in the car with Jake since someone should be around to go get the ranger in case everyone disappeared. Later, Mom and Dad said they knew it was probably foolish to go back into the woods, given that Chuck may have actually seen a bear, but his story was so outlandish that they didn't think he'd really seen anything at all, and had made it all up. So, we all carefully walked back to where he'd seen this thing, which wasn't far from camp at all. In fact, I could still see the sun shining off the car bumper, but Chuck was now acting as if he was about to cry again. So I guess my parents decided we'd gone far enough. It was then I noticed something dark brown over in the bushes. At that point, I was too scared to say anything, so I just tugged on my mom's sleeve and pointed. It's a cub, she said. We need to get out of here before the mom comes back. We went back to the car, and once safely inside, a debate started. Should they go back and see if the cub was okay, or just get a ranger? It ended up with Dad deciding to go take a quick look, and if the cub was still there and looked like it might be injured or something, they'd get a ranger. He knew it was a risky thing to do, but he had a spare spray, and it was so close to camp we couldn't just ignore it. Well, Chuck and I didn't know for years what actually happened out there, as my dad wouldn't tell us though I know he told my mom. But he was gone long enough that we started to get really worried, and when he showed back up, he was as white as a ghost and very quiet. He took my mom to the tent to talk, telling us to stay in the car, and when they came back out, they had a first aid kit. Now my mom also looked as white as a ghost. They told us to stay put, and if they weren't back in half an hour to go get a ranger, but under no circumstances were we to come into the woods looking for them. It was all very strange and mysterious. I'll never forget sitting in that car in the campground at Two Medicine with Chuck, wondering what was going on and if we would ever see our parents again. Chuck started crying again, and I asked him to describe in detail what he'd seen, thinking it might help him get over it, but he didn't want to talk about it anymore. Like I said, it was the beginning of the end of his wild stories, which was kind of sad in a way, because he was always very entertaining, but this one seemed to knock the stuffing out of him. So, we waited in the car. At one point, we heard a strange cry, and this made us both really worried, but fortunately, our parents returned soon after. They both looked relieved, and we were allowed to get out of the car though they told us Jake had to stay on a leash from then on, and we were to not even think about going anywhere out of their sight. There was talk of moving camp, but in the end, they decided to stay, saying they didn't want anyone else to find the cub, which was injured. They tried to help it out as best as they could. We were going to stay there as long as it took to make sure the cub was okay, and Chuck and I were not to go near it as the mom could be very dangerous. And from then on, Chuck and I were to sleep in the car with Jake, where it was safer. It was all very secretive after that. Our vacation went from being fun to being tense and on edge. I wondered why they didn't just get a ranger, as we'd been told since we were little that you didn't mess with the wildlife. And yet, here they were, doing exactly that. Our first night in the car was terrifying, to say the least. We had strict orders to not get out for any reason, and if we needed to go to the bathroom, we were to yell for one of our parents, and we had to keep the doors locked. Later, Mom and Dad said they hadn't wanted for us to know exactly what was going on because they knew we'd be afraid, but in retrospect, I think it would have been better if they'd been straight up with us from the start. After all, Chuck had already seen the thing, and... He knew what was going on, to some extent. Leaving us in the dark made things much worse, given what kids' imaginations can do, especially Chuck. So, that first night in the car, we hunkered down in our sleeping bags, 
Chuck in the front and me in the back with Jake, wondering what was out there in the dark and if our parents would survive the night with only a canvas tent for safety. It didn't help things when we heard a crying sound coming from the direction where the cub was. It was loud enough that we knew it wasn't a cub, but was instead probably its mom crying her heart out. Later, when it was all said and done, mom and dad would talk about things. We found out it wasn't a bear cub at all, but what was what dad called a Sasquatch. He refused to call it a Bigfoot, saying the term was derogatory and made it sound silly, like something with huge feet from a cartoon. He always called it a Sasquatch cub. Later, we learned when dad had first gone into the wood to look at the cub, he could see it had been put in a small nest made of sticks and soft grasses. He said it was in obvious pain and was very still, kind of like a young fawn or something would be, knowing that it should be quiet so as to not attract predators. Dad was scared to death, but he managed to get close enough to it to see it had a small branch run almost all the way through its foot, and to make things worse, the stick was flush with the foot as if someone had tried to extract it and had instead broken it off. It was quite a mess, he said. All he could figure was that the cub had jumped off something and hit the stick, the impact running it into its foot. He was afraid to touch it, yet he knew it needed help. And all the while he was there, he was aware that something was watching him. But he didn't feel threatened, but instead that it badly wanted him to fix it. He went back and got my mom, not really sure what to do. Should they call a ranger? What would they do with it? Or maybe there was a vet in Browning, which was the nearest town. He and mom talked about it for a while, then decided to try to help the cub as best as they could and take it from there. Now, my parents weren't doctors or nurses, but they both had been around animals a lot, having grown up on farms, and they kind of knew the basics. My mom said it was really harrowing when they first touched the cub, as they had no idea if its mom would attack them or if the cub would fight. But the cub was very docile, being in a lot of pain, and they never saw the mom. They knew she was nearby and aware of what they were doing. The wound was starting to fester, and mom gave the cub some painkillers she had for emergencies, though she and dad had wondered if it would be safe to do so. I guess she just stuck them in its mouth and it ate them or something. After a while, the cub went to sleep, and they were able to pull the stick out with some needle nose pliers dad had. They then poured antiseptic onto the wound. When they left, the cub was still sleeping, and mom was worried they'd given it something that wasn't good for it. They could hear a purring noise coming from the bushes, and they figured it was the mom. We spent the next few days in camp, our parents going to check on the so-called cub every day, putting more antiseptic on the wound. The mom was apparently feeding it, as when they took it some biscuits, it didn't want them. They left them for the mom, and they were gone the next time they went out there, so they started taking leftovers out for her, as they figured she wasn't able to forage or hunt much while watching over the cub. Between these nursing sessions, we'd go for hikes around the lake and play games and do stuff like that. But in all honesty, Chuck and I just wanted to go home. We were scared sleeping in the car like that, though we were starting to get used to it. And poor Jake, he was used to running free and suddenly had to be on a leash, which he didn't like one bit. At that time, you could stay in the campground at Two Medicine for two weeks maximum and our time was almost up. We would have to leave, regardless of how the cub was doing, though mom had said its foot seemed to be healing well. A couple of days before we would leave, Chuck and I were awakened at dawn by Jake growling. He then tried to get under my sleeping bag, which was impossible since I was still in it. I knew there was something in camp, and as I leaned up on my elbow, I could see a large black creature by the picnic table. It was still almost dark, so I didn't get a good look, but I did see enough to know it wasn't a bear. It looked over my way, maybe aware of motion in the car, then quickly slipped into the wood and was gone. I felt scared and confused, too afraid to even roll the window down 
and wake my parents, and I gradually slipped back asleep. When I woke, I could smell something really good cooking, something different. Mom and Dad had breakfast ready, and Chuck and Jake were already up. Mom told us to pack our stuff when we were done eating, as we were going home. She said that when they'd gone out to check the cub this morning, it was gone, and they knew it was now able to walk, its wound healed. The smell was the most delicious rainbow trout I'd ever had, along with some fried potatoes. It was a delicious breakfast. I can still smell it when I think of that morning on the shore of Two Medicine Lake. Had Dad gone fishing before we got up? It wasn't at all like him, for he wasn't much of a fisherman, nor an early riser. When I asked, Mom said that someone had left a big, beautiful trout on the picnic table. She had no idea who, but wondered if it wasn't maybe the neighbors, who had already left for the day. When I told her what I'd seen, she got real quiet, then told Dad, who just smiled, saying it was a gift. We were soon packed and gone, and though I've been back to Glacier several times, I've never returned to Two Medicine. I guess the memory of what happened is still with me, enough that I feel a bit of anxiety when I think about it. But since my kids are wanting to go, I know that one of these days I'll have to buckle down and face my fears from long ago. I often think of that Sasquatch cub my parents helped out, and I hope it's okay. It's probably a big, strapping Sasquatch at this point, or at least I hope so. When I asked them years later what it looked like, they said it was just like Chuck had told us, like a baby gorilla. I'll never know why they never took any pictures of it, but knowing my dad, it was probably from respect for the mom, or even fear, for he knew she was watching. My parents have been gone for a number of years, and after they told Chuck and me what had happened, they never talked about it again. To this day, Chuck won't talk about it, saying it was all a figment of our imagination, that we'd all had too much sun, even though it rained most of the time we were there. I find this ironic, given all the tall tales he used to tell, swearing they were true, but he always swore that the Sasquatch cub was imaginary. But when I ask him if he remembers how good that imaginary trout given to us by the imaginary Sasquatch tasted, he always said it was the best trout he had ever imagined eating. On to the next one. It's easy enough, in some cases, to discredit the testimony of one eyewitness as the product of hallucination, or human error as many do, but when a group of people all see the same thing, it becomes increasingly more difficult to dismiss. No less than three witnesses observed a tall, hair-covered humanoid with red eyes bound down a cliff face and run out onto the road in front of their car one night near Scottsville, causing them to run off the road. We were driving down through the countryside near a community called Perrytown, one of the witnesses, Willie C., later stated. As we got to the edge of the bridge at a place known as House Bluff, I looked up on the side cliff and it was horrible looking. Its eyes glowed red and it stared directly at us. My two friends didn't believe me until it jumped down into the creek and ran in front of the car and caused us to run off the road. According to Willie, the creature was between seven and nine feet tall with brownish orange hair and glowing red eyes. It made screaming sounds while running, which sounded like the screams of a woman. I was 15 when I saw this creature, he stated, and I have told very few about it because most would accuse you of being on drugs or being insane. Willie spoke about it again 20 years after the events allegedly took place and he is quite serious about the incident. He's 34 years old now, but still remembers that night just like it was yesterday. The incident took place a couple of miles outside of Scottsville in southern Allen County when he was 15 years old. As he and two others were driving through the mountainous regions near Perrytown just after dusk one evening in October, he happened to glance up at a cliff and spied the creature. Incredibly, it then jumped down onto a ridge 
aunt into the creek and ran out over a small bridge in front of their vehicle. The driver, his cousin, was so startled that he ran off the road and into the ditch. Willie was also able to add that the figure ran much faster than a man could, as fast as a deer, but only on two legs. The screaming it emitted as it ran was loud and unsettling to the entire group, sounding just like a terrified woman screaming. The sight scared the heck out of them all. At the closest point, it was only about 20 feet away from the vehicle and its passengers, which enabled them to get a pretty good look at the thing. Its face looked like a cross between an orangutan and a Neanderthal. Willie said it had a flat nose like a gorilla. Its eyes did not actually glow on their own, but reflected red in the vehicle's headlights. Although huge, it was built like a man with normally proportioned arms and legs. It had the hands of a man as well, but with long fingernails. The area of Allen County is known in certain circles as being home of a place called Monkey Cave Hollow, named thusly by the early settlers for the race of monkeys that were living in the area when the pioneers arrived. These strange monkeys reportedly foraged for food at night and lived in caves with the last of them being hunted to extinction over 100 years ago. Willie described the location in which the incident took place as heavily wooded, rocky bluff with at least one cave in the area. Did some of the monkeys survive the blazing guns of the early residents of Allen County? There is no doubt. Another resident of Scottsville, this time an elderly woman, claims that she saw a tall, upright monster covered in white, somewhat curly hair outside her home on Durham Spring Roads on two separate occasions in the spring. Both sightings took place in the evening. On the first occasion, she had just walked outside her home to see the thing reclining beneath a large beech tree in her front yard. After a few moments, she said it simply got up and walked away on two feet just like a person would do back into the woods. Like many other counties in the Commonwealth of Kentucky, Allen County has a history of high strangeness of every sort. The Scottsville area in particular seems especially prone to appearances by hairy humanoids or the monkey man, as it is called locally. Some locations are even named after these mysterious humanoids. Monkey Man Hollow, for instance, and Monkey Cave Hollow, mentioned in Lauren Coleman's classic mysterious America. These names were given by the early settlers and reflect the presence of these creatures in such areas, presences which are still felt in recent times. At around 9 p.m. one evening in the fall, a lone motorist got a glimpse of an unknown creature. Neil A. was taking a shortcut to his home in rural Scottsville, Kentucky, when the event unfolded. I was driving down Bridge Hollow Road, which is a shortcut I take to get from Barron River Lake area to my house. I was driving slow because it was night on a one-lane road. As the vehicle topped a small hill, he was shocked to see a huge animal run down an embankment on the right-hand side of the road and cross directly in front of him. It turned briefly and looked back. The witness stated, then struck out across a creek bottom on the left side of the road and disappeared into the wood. It stood around seven to eight feet tall, Neil claims, with long mangy hair all over its body. It was definitely male because as it turned to look at my car, I could see a protrusion in the genital area. The witness did not feel threatened because despite its size, the creature did not act aggressive at all. Every other description I have read makes the creature out to be aggressive. I don't think that is the case. When the animal turned and looked at me, the only emotion I saw in its eyes was peace. It reminded me of the movie Harry and the Henderson, a very intelligent and human-like creature with feelings and emotions, perhaps even thoughts. Neil said the creature appeared very calm and did not make any sounds, but he felt sure he had heard its howls in the area on several occasions. Scottsville, Kentucky also has a history of UFO activity and animal disappearances. 
on to the next one. The story came to me by my father and my grandfather. My grandfather, Gordon, and about four truckloads of men, 11 of them, fully armed with handguns, rifles, and shotguns, decided they wanted to take a trip up to the old ranger station near Bear Creek. At this time in late winter of 1976, the rangers weren't there. As young men in their 20s, with not much sense, they decided, let's break in and stay the night in the ranger station. So, they loaded up their truck and scout with beer and guns, and they swept off up the mountain from Stony Ford. They got to about Let Lake on Goat Mountain by the residential track when they all kind of felt like they were being watched. Anyhow, they pushed on through the snow all the way to Snow Mountain. They were at the Bear Creek crossing when they heard a loud, roaring howl, something like they'd never heard before. Then, from out of nowhere, a tree hit the first truck in the convoy. It came flying in like a spear, straight between the front and back wheel, pushing the truck up on its side. At the time, they were in a clearing about 30 feet by 50 feet with no slope. The tree was about two feet wide and 30 feet long with every single branch snapped off. I don't know to this day why they didn't realize that they were obviously being told to turn around. But anyway, lucky for them, my grandfather Gordon had a chainsaw. So they cut the tree into pieces and got the truck out. At this point, they knew something was going on, but it didn't faze them. They pushed on until the snow had gotten far too deep to drive through. Then they decided to walk the rest of the way to the ranger station. They had started on their way when they reached a clearing about 200 yards long. They heard the loud roar again, but this time they knew it was angry, whatever it was. Then they noticed that there were massive barefoot footprints walking from one side of the clearing to the other. They were about 17 inches long and 5 inches wide, and they were about 4 foot stride from one step to the next. All 11 men who were armed to the teeth with guns said, let's get the F out of here. They turned straight around and left. The next summer, my grandfather Gordon decided he wanted to go back to the clearing so he and my father Earl went on their way. When they reached the field, they were shocked to see dozens of trees flipped upside down with their roots in the air sticking into the ground in the one clear field. My grandpa and my dad refused to go back, and they have stared mountain lions down and lived, but refused to go back. Something didn't want them there, and they took their warning seriously. We now realize it was surely a Sasquatch. On to the next one. In October of 2013, just a few months after moving to Calumet Falls, Oregon from southwest Idaho, I took a trip down to Lake County for a few days to visit my mother. My stepson Brenton decided that he wanted to come with me because it just so happened that he was interested in a girl he'd met online who lived in Lake County as well. By this time, I was fully involved in the Bigfoot community and had shed the armchair and started doing my own loose definition of research here in Southern Oregon. Brenton often accompanied me on my outings so he had some real-world experience under his belt as well. He also accompanied me on this particular trip as we did some investigating out of the area near Pinnacle Rock, which is now behind a locked gate and no trespassing sign, and therefore is not accessible. On the day before we were to leave for home, Brenton got a ride in the morning to see the girl and had spent the day with her, we decided that I would go pick him up that evening at the southeastern edge of the lake in the city of Clear Lake, 
where the girl went to college. After I had dropped him off that morning, I had done a bit of exploring and, on the way back to Mom's, had driven out of Clear Lake Oak up to High Valley, and I took High Valley Road over the mountain back to night on the, on the north end of the lake. I went and picked up Brenton in Clear Lake, and we grabbed a bite to eat before heading back to Mom's in night. When we got to the Oak, as we Lake County locals call it, I headed straight up the mountain, up High Valley Road. Brenton was concerned at first that I was going the wrong way, but quickly got on board when I explained to him that this road would take us all the way over the mountain back to night. As we could stop and listen here and there on the off chance we could hear some kind of possible Sasquatch activity. The stuntman in me was itching for adventure on this last night in the area. It was a warm night in mid-October, and it was a nice drive with the windows down. The sound of the rocks from the road hitting the undercarriage was louder than the engine, and as we cruised along in my Dodge Dakota with the more economical and quieter V6 engine, as we drove along the top of the ridge, the road was cut out on the left side and dropped off on the right. Both Brenton and I heard something up above us, on the left, running along with the truck. Not only was it moving quite fast, as I was going about 35 miles an hour, but it sounded distinctly bipedal. This happened up on the ridge above High Valley. We were still a long way from our destination, and the sky was filled with color as the sun slowly set. We stopped the truck at a little turnout just down the road, and we shut her down and just listened for a few minutes. We didn't hear anything at all. Actually, it was oddly silent. I started it up, and we pressed on, with the window still down and the radio off so that we could hear outside just in case. We stopped and listened a few times as we made our way through the Mendocino National Forest land. A little bit further down the road, Brenton asked if I could stop so that he could go to the bathroom. We were roughly halfway back home to Mom's at night. I found a suitable spot to stop and slide it up against the manzanita brush with my right front fender. I had pulled just past a road that forked off to the right and Brenton opened the door and stepped out in that direction. I immediately heard large bipedal footsteps over across the road on my side of the truck. They were seemingly heading back toward me from out of the headlight, which I decided right away to leave on. I couldn't believe my ears. It was unmistakably large and unmistakably bipedal and I could feel the dang thing looking at me, but I couldn't see anything through the now very dark night. Brenton was heading back to the truck, and the rustling noise was settling in now, directly across the road from my open window. As Brenton got back in the truck, his actions were noticeably hasty, and we both tried to speak at the same time. I was asking him if he heard what was going on over on my side of the road, and he was trying to tell me he thought he'd seen something. I was first to ask a second time, and Brenton said yes. He had indeed heard the footsteps on my side of the road, but he also might have seen something. He said that as he was taking a leak, he saw something standing between the trees that looked like it was watching him, but... It didn't move at all. I said, that's what they do. And he was like, wow. I was very concerned about what was happening on my side of the road. And I periodically hit my brakes and checked the rearview mirror to make sure nothing was coming up behind us. Brenton said, check it out. I can see a hand on that tree. And I keep seeing something peek around it, looking at me. But... There's no way I was taking my eyes off my side of the road. I didn't care what he was seeing over on his side. There was an occasional rustling on my side of the road, and Brenton kept saying he could still see the one that was tree peeking. That's when something leaned over the hood of my truck and looked at Brenton through the windshield. It was behind the bush I parked up again. 
It was backlit by the headlight, and I could see what looked like gray mutton chop, but could make out no other detail. I couldn't even say for sure that it was a Sasquatch, but it was definitely something. It had a humanoid shape, and it was a good seven or eight feet tall, and it was leaning over and around that bush far enough to see Brenton in the passenger seat of my truck before it abruptly receded. We were excited and terrified at the same time. I think it was that very moment that I passed the stuntman torch off to Brenton and the younger generation. There's no shame in being a stunt coordinator. I still insist on doing some of my own stunts, though. Just leave the easy stuff to me, like heading towards the growls. I'll still do that. I started talking about how leaving might be a good idea, and he started talking about how staying and trying to talk to them was a better idea. I did not agree. A couple of minutes later, we heard a shout, huh, huh, that was pushed out of some very large lungs, maybe 20 feet away on Brenton's side of the truck. It was answered a moment later with an even louder, huh, huh, from 20 feet away on my side of the road. And a moment later, the night exploded with huh, huh sound from just down the hill behind Mr. Big Guy on my side of the road. And it sounded like there were about 20 of them. That was enough for me. And I started the truck and started to drive, much to the disappointment of my young stuntman protege. He kept saying that maybe we could talk to them, but I was like, no way, we're not staying here. I've personally never felt more threatened in my life. I honestly felt like we were being hunted. The next day, we left bright and early to head back home to Oregon. But we weren't quite settled about what had happened the night before. As we headed out of night, I turned up Bartlett Springs Road in lieu of heading straight out Highway 20 and informed Brenton that we needed to check out the spot we had stopped last night for possible evidence. We were going to look for footprints or any other evidence we could find. When we got back to the same fork in the road, Brenton jumped out of the truck and said, it's gone. What I saw last night isn't there now. As I looked up the road, I saw a gate and behind that gate was a meadow filled with cheap grass that sloped uphill before the forest reclaimed the landscape. It was easy to see how the trees and the figure Brenton saw were in the silhouette despite the dark night. He said that the figure he saw was between two little trees that were just to the left of that gate. I told him to stand where he was, relieving himself, and I walked over between the trees and confirmed with him that I was in the right spot. Then I asked him, how tall was the figure you saw? And he said it was at least three feet taller than me. I stand six foot two, and if his estimation was even close, we're talking about something that's nine foot plus. We checked the area around the tree where Brenton had seen the peeker, and the tree litter on the ground at the base of the tree was definitely trampled by something with some serious weight. We could find no print where the creature looked in the windshield or across the road from me, but once again, the ground is covered by six or eight inches of tree litter, and it's nearly impossible to pick up print in that form of material. We did, interestingly, find some pristine bear print at the location. They were at the intersection of the two roads at a point that would have been well behind my truck the night before. They were the best print I've ever found of anything. They came out perfectly in the light dust on the road. They were cool, but unfortunately, they had absolutely nothing to do with our experiences the night before. Bears in California generally aren't nine feet tall and standing completely still. Bears don't sound bipedal when they walk. It certainly was no bear that we saw looking through the windshield at us. And bears don't make primate-like noises when they do decide to open their big, fat, toothy mouth. On to the next one. I was about a hundred yards away from our camp when I spotted what I thought was a cub bear looking around the camp. This was in broad daylight, around three in the afternoon. 
What really caught my attention was the concentrated interest this cupbearer was paying to my backpack in particular. I stood in one place for about two minutes watching the sight from a hundred yards when this cub bear stood up and began to walk away. At 18 years of age, I couldn't force my mind to accept what my eyes were telling me. I watched the baby Bigfoot, approximately four and a half feet tall, walk away from me into the forest for probably a full minute in duration. It disappeared into the trees at a distance of approximately 200 to 250 yards from me. Its arms swung like a person, and it walked with a smooth gait, not at all like a chimp or a gorilla. The hair was standing up on the back of my neck, and I had a sense that I was witnessing something unnatural. I didn't tell anyone about this incident until recently. On, on to the next one. During fall in Calaveras County in California, my father and I were deer hunting in the area of Railroad Flat. We arrived late one afternoon and set up camp. Then we decided to go separate ways and scout the area around camp for sign of deer. I climbed a small rise and came to an open area with a wide path running along the top of the hill. I proceeded to follow the path for a short ways but I had an uncomfortable feeling. I didn't see any deer tracks, so I returned to where we had camped. The next morning, I discovered it had rained lightly during the night, leaving the ground muddy. I climbed the rise to the path where I had been the day before. When I came to the path, I immediately saw large footprints. They were deep in the mud, about 14 or 15 inches in length. They were shaped like human bare feet. They were heading down the path that I had followed the day before. Some of the footprints were on top of the ones that I had left the day before. I proceeded to follow them down the path. When the path sloped downward, the prints slid, leaving elongated prints. The path continued on along the ridge top, but the tracks suddenly took a left turn, heading off the trail and down the side into the trees and underbrush. Needless to say, I didn't follow them. On to the next one. In November, in San Diego County, I only know we were up in some small mountain or large hills, whatever you want to call them. We were somewhere in Camp Pendleton. Not sure of where. They took us out in trucks, and then we walked to the location. The nearest town was Oceanside, California. While in infantry training at Camp Pendleton in California, we had dug in on a very large hill and were expecting an enemy force to attack in the night. I had one Marine with me, and to our left were two others about 30 yards away. They were also dug in. We had a steep rock-covered area right in front of us. We heard something coming up the side of the mountain. We could hear rocks rolling down the mountain. It came up over the edge, and the Marine with me yelled, Halt! It stood up right in front of us, about six feet away. I could see the outline of this creature, and it was huge. It looked about three and a half feet wide. It had long arms and a pointed head. It was very tall. From the hole we were in, I had to look almost straight up at it. I couldn't believe how big it was. It was so tall, big, and wide. I could see the outline very well, but could not make out its features. It made no noise, and there was no smell we could detect. It stood there for about one minute and then walked between us and the other Marines. I was terrified at the time, and my hair was standing up. I tried not to breathe. I had no idea what to expect from it. After it had passed and was out of sight, the four of us made sure we had all seen the same thing. Everyone said they were not going to say a thing. I have never before reported this, but now I know they exist. We also moved out before dark, though we could not check for track, but I knew there had to be some. 
On to the next one. Mr. Charlie Jackson and his six-year-old son, Kevin, and his dogs ran for cover. They had been watching a bonfire they had built when they saw a female hairy humanoid standing on an old building 15 feet away. She had black skin on her chest, and her face, which was almost bare through the rest of her, was covered with filthy gray hair. She was seven to eight feet tall and had no neck and also had giant flat breasts, which hung down to her navel. She had a puzzled look on her face. Her arms were longer than a human's, and she swung her arms when walking. She was four to five feet wide at the shoulders and had a yellowish chest area. The feet were 14 to 15 inches long and very flat and wide. The three normally fierce dogs were cowering under the furniture inside the house. On to the next one. My father was and is a great woodsman, a hunter and fisherman who taught my brother and myself all about the forest and what types of plants and animals live there. My father was also a man of science, and this is important to note as will become evident later. At the end of each summer season, my family and some other forestry families would get together and take several weeks vacation. Most often, we would load canoes and float down the lower 15 to 30 miles of the Kalamath River to its mouth. My father and I would fly fish for steelheads in the river during the mornings and evenings, and we would spend the hot hours of the day canoeing, exploring, and resting. These trips would often take one or two weeks to complete. During one of these trips, Probably in 1969 or 1970, I was about eight to nine years old, I think. We made camp on the river bar at the mouth of Tech Ta Creek. There was a good flat bar there, and at that time of year, the creek was flowing under the sand and appeared dry. One afternoon, while everyone else was napping, my father and I took a walk up the creek bed to see if the creek was flowing on the surface somewhere in land. About 200 yards upstream, the creek did come to the surface and flowed sluggishly through a series of large pools. I remember my dad telling me these pools were probably full of baby salmon and steelhead waiting for fall rains to allow them to swim down the main river and out to sea. My dad had a very scientific mind, and he would describe natural processes in great detail when we had the patience to listen. As we proceeded inland up the creek, we rounded a bend and entered a long sandy bar on the east side of a long arching pool in the creek. As I looked across the surface of this tiny bar, I saw a set of tracks in the soft sand. These tracks caught my attention because they were very large and the space between them seemed very long, like if I had laid down next to them. They would almost be further apart than the length of my body. The tracks also seemed to sink a lot deeper into the sand than the footprint of my dad, who is pretty big at six foot two. The tracks began at the water's edge at the lower end of the bar and proceeded diagonally across the bar in a straight line to the far end of the bar. My father never told me any stories about Bigfoot. He would deny the existence of any animal that was unknown until science recognized it anyhow. And to my knowledge, I had not heard of any such animal at that time, nor had I anything more than a passing interest in these types of things. But these tracks, their size, gait, and the way they led across the bar in a straight line, they made a funny impression on me. My father was also very interested in the tracks. He asked me, please, not to walk near or in them then asked me to sit down while he spent several minutes comparing his foot size to them and trying to match their spacing by walking next to them. He seemed very tense, as if he sensed something or was trying to figure something out. Eventually, I got bored and I got up and followed him. When I finally caught up with him, we were halfway up the bar. He had stopped looking at the track and was instead 
looking intently at the timber ahead and at the southern edge of the bar. He was very quiet and tense. I have never seen my father frightened or worried about anything before or since, for that matter, but watching him, the way he scanned the surrounding forest so intently made me very nervous and excited. I broke the silence and began to ask him what he thought made the track and what he was trying to see in the trees. He turned around, almost jumping a little in surprise, and told me to be quiet. Then he looked around some more and darted back towards the camp with a quick pace, grabbing me by the hand and saying that these are the tracks of a big bear, son, and we should leave this area alone for now. Then he told me not to come up the creek alone and not to tell Mama or my brother or any of the others anything about what we saw, that it might worry them or something, and that he would speak no more of this matter, just like that. Well, the older I get, the funnier that incident and those tracks seem to me. I have hunted for many years and have seen and tracked many animals in the woods since that time and have never seen anything like that since. I am 38 now and my father has retired. I asked my father about this incident last year and he was silent and pensive for a long time. Then he told me, that he doesn't remember seeing this or seeing anything other than bear tracks. I don't know what we really saw that day, but I do know that it scared my dad and he has never ever spoken to me the way he did on that day or behaved that way since. It was very quiet and as a small boy in that country, I have many times felt uneasy about the woods around me like I was being watched. Sometimes I would sit and listen for long periods, but I never saw or heard anything. After doing lots of research in later life, I learned there are many stories about this area through history. I hope you enjoyed those encounters, and if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day. So be sure to hit that notification bell and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much and until next time, bye!